Hi, and welcome to the Silo AI webinar series. Today we have a guest with us, Professor Arno Solin. Welcome. Thank you for coming here. Um, Arno Solin, uh, even in young of age, has had time to do a lot of really cool stuff. Today he's going to talk about machine learning for real-time inference in sensor fusion and model adaption, but his uh, history goes back to a PhD in, in computer science. You have been also part in a tech startup. Um, you're a professor now, and you're also a principal investigator for Academy of Finland project. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you taking time to come here to Silo and uh, talk about uh, machine learning uh, and your field. The floor is yours. Please welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as you already heard, uh, the topic today uh, is machine learning. That's something that we all like a lot. Um, and in more specific terms, uh, I'm interested in real-time inference um, with applications in sense of fusion and model adaption. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to cover a number of things in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to start with some motivation uh, to give you an overview of the kind of problems and uh, data I'm interested in. Um, then, then comes the beef. Um, I'm like, I'm going to talk about Gaussian processes. Like, that's a spoiler alert already. And um, a second model family, which is uh, very important to me, are stochastic differential equations. And uh, I'm going to through. I'm going to through, uh, go through the link, how these relate to each other. Um, then, um, the actual uh, thing is uh, online estimation and uh, in like, temporal, spatial temporal GP models. I have some examples of that and some recent research related to those things. Uh, then I dive into more applied things, uh, where actually these models uh, can do pretty cool stuff in like real problems. Um, I have a quick demo of, of uh, doing inertial odometry using a standard smartphone. Uh, I'm going to show some recent work in uh, creating maps of magnetic fields, like the, the very magnetic field that surrounds us at this very moment. Uh, and then uh, I have a recent recent thing that we we, we did, uh, very fun projects actually, how to do a magnetic slam. Uh, I have some cool videos of that, that then, later on. And then I'm going to end with a recap of, of the topics. And then hopefully you have some questions. You can start thinking of those already now. Okay, without further ado, um, let's go into the, the uh, presentation of the uh, problems I'm interested in. So uh, the sort of uh, very basic setup that you could think of are like one dimension problems, where the, where the data has a natural ordering. Uh, in layman terms, this would be like time series models. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, I'm going to go through this, this example later on, but you might have, for example, uh, observations, daily observations of something. That might be the temperature, or in this case, uh, it's the number of, of childbirths in the US every day for, for a very long, long time period. And then you want to do some explanatory modeling or predictions, or uh, just like dive into the data and see, see what's going on. Um, so that's the four, first uh, kind of like family of data and, and problems. Uh, the second one is uh, not very different actually. Um, so consider like in a time series model, you have, you have a single thing which you observe over time. Uh, in in spatial temporal models, you have some more complex uh, quantity that you you want to study, and that quantity develops over time. That might be sort of the, uh, the like temperature field, uh, like the different temperatures in, in entire Finland uh, over the summer. So there's like a spatial component, which is like the, the latitude and longitude, and then there's like a temporal temporal thing going on, which is time. Um, and for example. Uh, uh, it could be, for example, that you're interested in modeling the, the amount of rainfall, the precipitation uh, in some specific area, and then you have observations, like sparse observations, and you want to sort of interpolate and, and explain what's going on over time. So that's, that's like the spatial temporal setup. Um, and 
these kind of models uh, come back to uh, in the end of the presentation. Um, a second example of a spatial-temporal thing could be, could be for example, the, the human brain. So you have you have spatially things going on. You're thinking about cats. You're thinking about dogs. You're considering uh, something more business-like. Um, but it's a, it's a spatial-temporal process going on in your head. So there's activations in, in different parts, and there's temporal component, which is again time. Um, yeah, I'm not going to dive into this this brain stuff uh, today, but so that you see that there are applications in many many places. Um, one point interesting thing is that if you have a time series uh, model for a data stream, which means that you have a stream of observations coming in in real time, uh, and the stream might sort of not start at a specific time nor end. It's, it's a stream, it keeps coming whether you want it or not, and you want to do some real time inference. Um, so that's like, like your the number of data points is like infinite in theory, and you still want to sort of handle the, the thing. And, uh, hopefully in, in real time and hopefully with, with good models. So these are sort of key things that I'm, I'm interested in my research. Then uh, how these show up then in, in practice, uh, there can be like many incarnations of these things, but uh, first you sort of get a rough idea of these things. Okay, um, one example of a, um, of a data streaming uh, application uh, is for example, uh, things related to, to smartphones. These, these bad boys have a lot of sensors in them and they provide observations of the surroundings at 100 hertz, even more in some cases. And then sort of how to, how to use the data uh, online, in real time, and even with the, the limited uh, computational capabilities that you have in one of these phones. That's, that's something that very much interests me. Good. Uh, that was sort of a very brief introduction to the kind of things, uh, applications uh, I'm interested in. Good. Then uh, let's get some equations uh, and have a look at these, these models. Uh, so um, typically uh, I tend to use Gaussian processes for, for models. There's, there's a very clear release, reason for this. These are kind of uh, very powerful models in combining uh, prior knowledge um, into your, your, your model. You might have some quite strong prior knowledge about the problem and you want to sort of inject that into, into the thing. So in this case here, uh, we have a, a temporal process, uh, some unknown function f, which is a function of t, time. This is a one-dimensional unknown function. And uh, we can assign some prior assumptions to its behavior uh, by saying it's a, it's a Gaussian process uh, where the, the prior assumptions are encoded into the, the uh, kappa here, the, the kernel. Um, and these prior assumptions might be something that you know that uh, the latent thing is, is continuous. There's not like sudden jumps in the, in, the, in the thing. Or there might be periodicity, say you're modeling uh, the temperature. So it's quite uh, a safe assumption to think that there's probably some daily thing going on. Um, but those assumptions might be something totally different. They might be uh, induced from, from physics, uh, first principles, uh, or something. Then the second part here uh, relates the, the latent, the hidden thing that we assume something about, the observations. We have some observations, why? About, about the unknown hidden thing f. And uh, now this thing here, uh, the likelihood part, uh, if you're doing regression, then uh, this might just be like we have uh, y is just, just f corrupted by some noise. Or then we might do, do classification where our uh, y's are just, just observations of the, the categories that we are you're interested in, um, but the likelihood relates those to each other. And if you can formulate your problem into this form, you have a likelihood, and you have some prior assumptions about the, the, the kernel structure, then you're pretty well off. 
then the only problem is related to how to solve the problem. And that's a totally like, different story. But being able to write down the problem as a, as a GP, a Gaussian process, that's sort of the first step in many of the, the tasks. Um, the second model family I'm interested in uh, are stochastic differential equations. This might sound a bit scary, uh, but these, these guys are just, they are differential equations. That's sort of high school stuff. Um, and the, the sort of the trick comes that they are stochastic. Which means that every time you solve the differential equation, you actually get a different solution. Which sounds quite hairy, I admit. But actually, these, these models are quite powerful uh, in the way that um, they are good in uh, handling uncertainties. Unlike a lot of known unknowns in your model, um, which you can model easily uh, in many cases. These models are used in finance a lot uh, and in physics. But they are sort of not that well known to, to typical machine learning researchers. And uh, a large part of my research has been in, uh, in drawing arrows between these two metal families. How to convert one inch into uh, the other and the other way around. So how, what are the sort of the, the relations here between these? And there's a very good reason for this. So uh, in terms of like GP models, written down using the kernel formalism. Um, this is a very convenient way of specifying your problem. So converting this formulation into this formulation, the upper to the lower one, uh, often is very sort of nice for building models. Setting up the problem and like knowing the problem is the first step of solving it. Um, but then there's a second arrow. So actually being able then to solve the problem down here in the SD formulation has some nice properties. Uh, first of all, in many cases, you actually get linear scaling with the number of data points. And uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with GPs, GPs are great in many ways, but often the practical application of GP, GPs uh, sort of, uh, run into problems when you have a lot of data. So actually being able to solve these, these like temporal GPs uh, in ON is actually quite crucial to actually really applying these things uh, in real applications. And uh, the second thing why, why it's sort of good to also be able to sort of go, go back from SDEs to like the kernel formulation of GPs is that uh, say in physics uh, or in uh, control engineering you often uh, specify some like prior assumptions or some models in terms of uh, differential equations. That's sort of the, the common way of doing it. So then actually if you have a, a model that's sort of well known and used, you can actually like turn that into a GP model and then you have sort of all the uh, existing machine learning machinery uh, available and ready to be used for you. Yeah, so this is sort of the model, model kind of things. Um, I'm going to avoid equations from here on. Um, so if you don't really want to go into details and see how, how these things work, uh, a good starting point uh, would be a book that is coming out uh, from me and Professor Simo Serke later this year. It's called Applied Stochastic Differential Equations. Uh, or then actually there's a recent paper uh, by some, some uh, co-authors, one of them actually, uh, worked for Silo, uh, so uh, we had a paper in ICML uh, actually tackling the, the, like the non-Gaussian likelihoods and how to how to actually like use the existing very powerful machinery in in, uh, in for GPs uh, in like combination with the, with the SD things. Okay, uh, the latent function like the unknown uh, function f, so. Uh, in terms of, of the, the SDE, the actually thing boils down to uh, converting uh, the SD model then into a state space model. And state space modeling is, is sort of very sort of uh, the main thing in, in, uh, in, in many signal processing fields and, and control engineering fields. And then actually the, the solution then to the problem uh, boils down to doing Kalman filtering, which might be a familiar term for, for some of you. I uh, actually have an example of, of 
GP regression, um, just in case that uh, someone wants to have a pictorial introduction. So say that we have some we have some data. These points are some data. Let's say we have we have a, like these are like inputs here uh, on the on the x-axis, and then we have some outputs on the y-axis, and then uh, plotted the, the data points like this. And then uh, we have some prior assumptions. Let's do what to do regression, and we uh, might assume that the the, uh, the latent explaining these these uh, these uh, observations. It's like a continuous uh, differentiable function, um, and then the observations are then corrupted by Gaussian noise. So if we, we do the like the basic GP uh, regression thing, then uh, we have something like this. Uh, it gives us predictions about latent uh, and then some like uh, uncertainty bounds of, of the phenomena. Uh, and this scales as O n to the third. So if you have a lot of data, this like sort of doesn't quite work. Um, but then uh, we can formulate the exactly the same model and solve it using uh, like the SD formulation and actually run a Kalman filter and smoother on the data in ON. And uh, what that actually means is that we sequentially consider each data point. Forward and backward and actually we end up with exactly the same solution but now in ON. So now like the, the number of data points is actually not a problem anymore because like adding one new data points only like sort of adds a constant uh, requirement for more compute. So that's sort of the nice thing here. And uh, there are a lot of GP priors this can be applied to, uh, like linear models, uh, then different like Wiener processes, um, like Wiener velocity models, and then sort of different assumptions about the smoothness properties uh, and the like, if, uh, yeah, basically the smoothness properties or the periodicity or, or whatever. So that you can combine then like different, different sort of prior uh, assumptions about the latent functions, and then encode that into into uh, uh, like a prior kernel for your GP. Good, and then you can of course like combine these, make some some products, and actually make quite complicated models with a lot of assumptions. Um, so a practical example, I will show you like a brief teaser about this problem. So uh, let's consider the number of birds in the US. Uh, and we have data uh, between the years 1969 and 1988. And that's some uh, 7,000 data points, which is like uh, not that much, but still sort of enough for the sort of cubic uh, complexity to be a bit annoying. And uh, we can encode a prior uh, into the sort of latent, where you assume that there's like a uh, some slowly moving trend going on. Um, we don't know about the movement, but we know that it's sort of slowly moving and, and, and uh, quite smooth. And then we have a, like a faster component, um, which might be there or might not be there. Uh, and then we assume that there's some periodicity going on. So that's like the number of childbirths uh, per day has something to do with the time of the year. This might be a real thing or not, but we, we include like a component for that. And then there's a number of hyperparameters then, uh, like weighting these, uh, scaling these, and we can optimize that those hyperparameters with respect to natural light. And what we get out uh, is something like, like this, where we have like the trends, the, the slowly moving trend, which tells us that, that uh, there's things changing over time, uh, over like the time horizon of, of years. There's uh, like the, like you know, like the baby boomers in the 1940s and so on. So there's like not that strong effects, but still like clear effects related to to how time goes on. And then uh, the more interesting effects are then the seasonal effects. Um, actually, there's two seasonal components. There's the the time of the year, the, the the monthly thing, and then the different lines here show how the behavior. Uh, or the effect of time of year has changed over the years. So there's actually been changes going on. Um, so this the peak time, like September, seems to be like the most, uh, like the most favorable 
uh, month for, for child deliveries. Um, but then that's been like changing a bit. Like there's uh, less, uh, more children born, born for example in April, May uh, than uh, before. And the maybe, at least to me, the most like interesting thing in, in this data is the changes in the, like, the weekday behavior. And uh, like this data set has been analyzed a lot. And uh, this is not so, from sort of my speculation. Uh, it's been, for example, discussed by, uh, by uh, in, the, in the book by Wielman et al. Uh, about Bayesian data analysis. And the, the day of week effect, sort of, you can see that there actually is less children being born in Saturdays and Sundays, uh, like 1988, than it was in like 1972. And this apparently because of the, the medical doctors don't wanting to work during weekends. So instead they sort of start the, the delivery on Fridays or delay to Monday or do C-sections uh, during weekdays. Um, so actually like the, the number of C-sections are typically only done during the week, week. And when the number of C-sections then goes up, then like there are more children born, born during the weekdays. I think this is quite nice, nice data and sort of you, you get sort of like real, real things out of it. Like this is sort of like exploratory analysis of the data. Um, okay, that was sort of with, with, a, with a Gaussian likelihood. Um, we can do non-Gaussian likelihoods. I'm not going into details here, but you can do a lot of uh, robust regression, uh, log Gaussian Cox process, processes or, uh, or classification uh, in a handy way. And then like there are different ways of dealing with the, with, like, the non-Gaussianity there. And uh, there are many, many ways of doing it. Um, like some, some of the more typical ones are maybe like uh, doing a Laplace approximation, uh, using variational Bayes methods um, or, or like expectation propagation. Um, but without going into details here, uh, I'm just going to sh show you an example of, of what this, this could actually mean in practice. Um, so let's model aircraft accidents. So um, this is actually something that uh, we came up while, while writing the ICML paper uh, mentioned earlier. So actually we scraped the data from Wikipedia, uh, which lists all the dates of the commercial aircraft accidents uh, between the years 1919, like pretty early days in aviation, and 2017. And then we, we model the, the, uh, the accident uh, intensity per day with a log Gaussian Cox process. That means like a poison likelihood for like day bins. And that gives us some 36,000 data points, which is pretty, pretty much for like vanilla GPs already. And uh, we have again, we have like a trend going on and then like a yearly component. And I'm also going to show you some more, more recent things uh, where actually also include like a day of week effect. Um, and then we, okay, again, we learned the hyperparameters of these co uh, covariance functions uh, using like uh, optimization, just pretty much like it. So then we get something like this. So, uh, well, the number of flights has gone up. So there's no surprise that the, uh, accident intensity has sort of followed the, the number of commercial flights uh, growing. Um, but it's sort of hard to see something from this. So instead, um, this is more interesting. So here down here on the x-axis, we have the, the year. And then I have the month here on the y-axis. And then the sort of the, the relative intensity of, of, of uh, aviation accidents uh, can then be sort of seen, seen from the plot. Um, so, for example, from this, I would consider not, like nowadays, we are somewhere here, I would probably not recommend flying in August, because, yeah, clearly more danger to fly in August. Uh, there might be more flights as well, but still. Um, and I have some very recent results, actually day of week effect, which is quite interesting as well. Now the year is here on the, on the y-axis, so if you go here to, to like today, it's, it's Wednesday today, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so Wednesday is a pretty bad choice for flying uh, because it's August and Wednesday. Yeah, it's good that you're here, not on the airplane. 
Uh, but yeah, this is quite interesting, I think. And this kind of modeling, the data is really messy. You only have the dates. It's a very sparse. Uh, you only have the dates of fly, like aviation accidents. But then you can actually like come up with something like this. It's, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. You, you might disagree. Um, OK. Um, I thought about optimizing the hyperparameter, the model. So you, you still have some free parameters, which you, you sort of need to, need to find in your, in your kernel. And in case your data is actually coming in right now, so if you have the aviation accidents, there's no problem. You can optimize, you can run your optimizer on the hyperparameters. But then if your application is such that you have a data stream and you need to find the hyperparameters online, you don't have time to like stop and uh, optimize and then come back to the problem, but you need to find the hyperparameters right now. So that's sort of what online learning of the hyperparameters is about. So again, we have a GP model, uh, the GP prior and the likelihood. And the, the hyperparameters are now here in, in blue. Um, so there's some free parameters in the kernel. And there might be some free parameters in the likelihood, say like a noise scale or something like that. Uh, and these are often learned that you, you optimize the, the, uh, with respect to the marginal likelihood and find some point estimate for your, for your hyperparameters t. Um, Instead, you could have like a rolling window and then some magical way of, of correcting for the, for the uh, fact that you're actually only using a window of the data. Uh, there's a lot of details related to this. We have a submitted paper which is actually tackling this, this problem. But yeah, just to, to give you a pictorial overview, I'm going to skip the details and just, just go forward. So. Uh, we can actually do like, like incremental uh, gradient descent then in this rolling window and then uh, sort of adapt to changes in the data stream. Which means that the, the hyperparameters of the model then adapt to local changes in data. And I have some pretty cool examples of where this can be used. Um, the first example uh, is uh, the electricity consumption of one household over a pretty long time period. Uh, so we observe the, the electric consumption of the, of the house every minute for 1,400 for the two days, which gives us a grouping 2 million and something data points. And now we would like to sort of do prediction uh, of the electric consumption based on the, on the sort of behavior in that household. People come home at a certain time, uh, they might like be more home during weekends. They might like cook more during the weekends. They use the oven. They use the sauna. Um, so there's more electricity consumed, like probably the evenings, probably during the weekends. But then people people are different. In some families, people might be away for the weekend or, or always. And there's no extra use by, during the weekend. So you you might have a model, but then you need to sort of adapt to to that household. So you might, might need to sort of optimize your parameters of the model to sort of fit that household energy consumption. Um, so we use like a window of 10 days, which allows us to uh, both like adapt to that household and also adapt to changes in electric consumption of that household. And uh, of course, we could just like optimize the hyperparameters using like the entire data set. Um, as we did for the, for the uh, airline accident and, and bird example. And it would sort of 2 million data points, no problem, it would run. But then it couldn't like, be able to adapt to changes and not like, run in real time like, uh, for, for those people. Um, so here, actually the, these plots here up, up here are just like uh, some like 10 day snips from the entire data set. Like, they are from here. And then what down here actually doesn't show the electric consumption, but the hyperparameters. So because there's like clear uh, changes, for example, here, um, the house has been, been vacant. The people have been away for several weeks. And then of course, there are no periods that are going on and so on. So then the, the sort of the model turns off the periodic components in the, in the model. Um, and then when they come back home and start their like daily lives again, 
uh, then sort of model turns on those periodic components and, and adapts to that. And that makes it possible to predict forward uh, using like the, the most current knowledge of, of the engineer. Um, the next example is, is a toy example, but actually uh, it really runs in real time. Um, so I have some data which I can generate by shaking the phone. It's the actuometer in the phone, uh, one of the axes. Um, so I can sort of create different behaviors in the data stream online. And then I want to, to fit a GP to that data. And because sort of the data can uh, have different sort of magnitudes and strengths, uh, the hyperparameters of the model sort of adapt to the different behavior of, of my shaking of the phone. And here, like here you can see the sort of the, the data being generated and then the GP fit to the data. And down here, the like current uh, hyperparameters, the length scale and magnitude parameters, like the amount of force and the, the sort of the uh, length scale again, then tells something about the, the how rapid changes there are in the data. Okay, uh, let's see. I just runs on the, on the iPhone uh, in real time. You see, I'm doing some soft movements, uh, it adapts to that. Then some stronger movements, the, the magnitude uh, goes up. And I do like stronger things, use more force. And then the quicker movement, more rapid movements I do, then uh, sort of pulls down the length scale to being able to adapt to that. And then uh, not touching it, the the magnitude goes, goes down, the length scales okay, goes up, and then again, I take it, it adapts to the data. Uh, of course, this is, this is a toy example, but actually uh, this could be the uh, same methodology can be applied for sort of any data stream, where you want to encode prior knowledge about the thing and adapt to, to, to changing circumstances in the data. Okay, um, then I continue my pictorial tour uh, of, of, uh, of applications. So now that you saw the smartphone, uh, let's continue with that. So sensor fusion uh, refers uh, to combining sensor information from, from several sources. And uh, as I mentioned, these, these small things have all sensors. Uh, most typically they have actuometers telling about the, the sort of the forces being applied to the device and also telling telling about the direction of down like where where our planet is in relation to, to the phone um, they have gyroscopes which tell about the the, uh, the rotational rate of the phone and then they have more sensors like uh, cameras GPS sensors uh, so on um, let's let's concentrate on the actual meter and gyroscope uh, so uh, as, you, as you probably know, uh, as you certainly know, the, the velocity is, is, is the integral of acceleration. Um, position is, is like velocity integrated. And because we can observe both the angular velocity, which tells about the orientation of the phone and changes in that, and the acceleration, uh, we should in theory be able to like integrate the acceleration two times and get a very accurate uh, position estimate of the phone, how the phone actually moves in 3D space. Like we should be able. Um, in practice, this is quite tricky, mostly because of uh, the fact that the sensors in these, these phones are really small, really cheap, and uh, they have horrible noise profiles, and uh, sampling rates are not, not that not great. Um, so there are, there are problems in the data, let's put it short. Uh, still, we, we can do things. Um, just going to go quickly through this. So uh, let's say we have a dynamical model, uh, so discrete time model, basically just telling us that the position P uh, is uh, the previous position plus uh, the previous velocity times delta t. Um, we have uh, the velocity, uh, which is 
only basically the uh, effect of gravity uh, removed from the uh, turned accelerations and then integrated and then we propagate the orientation of the funnel. And this is a typical problem for, for extended color filtering. And why this is actually quite interesting is that this model is extremely simple and as such it doesn't work because there's a problem with the data. It's like the, the noise uh, is corrupting the, the sensor readings and you need to transform the sensor readings into a form that actually can be, be used by this model. So we need to learn online the, the sort of the noise transformations of the data. Uh, we use some additional constraints. Um, basically, um, in this case, the knowledge when the phone is stationary. That's of course several of the updates. And uh, I have an example uh, collected just with a normal iPhone, uh, where I only use the gyroscope and dextrometer, and the sampling rate of the, the sensor is 100 hertz. Um, yeah, let's see. So, welcome to my bedroom. Um, so the, the phone is, is going to like, touch the walls and I'm going to indicate each time it's on a wall that it should draw a line and, uh, for, for that wall. And the line comes from the orientation of the phone. And you can see then the phone is there. I'm pressing a button and you see a wall, wall appearing. And then can actually then infer the position of the phone in 3D space and it's really hard to do this with two phones by the way um, to film the one phone uh, with the other one and you can see that it's actually once it touches the wall it gets sort of knowledge of the zero velocity which helps constrain the model and actually you see that the the room shape is is rectangular, even though the model has no knowledge of that. And then again, now I've told it it's, it's back on the first wall, that's number one. So you can actually get like centimeter precision of the phone moving in 3D space uh, by actually accurately learning the, the uh, noise transformations of the data. I think this is a pretty cool example. Good. Um, I have some further examples um, where I use the magnetometer as well. Um, I'm going to go through the first part of the, the magnetometer examples uh, quite quickly uh, and then show you the, the uh, actual beef. Um, so the magnetic field uh, is something that uh, is caused by the, by, the, uh, by the earth but then actually we are not observing the actual magnetic field. For example in this room we have a lot of metal in the walls, pipes and stuff, and there are metal all over the place, which sort of causes anomalies to the magnetic field. So actually, um, we observe something like this, where there are like these bumps tell about the, the sort of local anomalies in the field. And uh, if we know what the field looks like, we can sort of use that information for, for, uh, for positioning ourselves in, in the field as well. But there are many applications of this. And um, the cool thing is that the, the phone compass is actually a magnetometer, three axis magnetometer, telling about the, the magnetic field uh, directions and, and uh, strengths. And uh, yeah, as you might have noticed, the compass is not very useful indoors because of these anomalies. But we can use those as a source for information in our case. And the cool thing is also that there's no need to install the magnetic field. It's there whether you want it or not. So it's only a matter of, of measuring and modeling and using the, the knowledge. Um, so magnetic field is a, is a vector field. Uh, here you can see that the, the metal uh, leg of the table causes a bump here. And in, in sort of larger scale, as you saw in the earlier picture, there are like a lot of things going on building level and so on. And again, we formulate the model as a, as a spatial uh, magnetic field uh, model for the, for the, uh, for the magnetic field uh, as a GP 
where we encode the earth contribution. Um, let's put those there. Earth contribution uh, as, as like a linear component in a, like a scalar potential um, for, the, for the magnetic field. Um, and then we have some local anomalies coming from the, from the uh, disturbances around us. And this is motivated by, by some like 101 physics, um, where we sort of uh, can assume that the demand field uh, is actually generated in this case by a scalar potential, which we observe through, through like the, the, the gradient. And uh, this holds as long as we are for, far away from any, any free, free currents, um, which means that we are not going through any electric cabling and so on. Which, yeah, we aren't, which is nice. And then we have some corrupting Gaussian noise here. Um, I have an example of, of a robot uh, using this model for, for a mapping the magnetic field driving around, making measurements using a magnetometer, and like online, then updating its knowledge about the magnetic field. And here in this case, for example, there's like some pipes going up, like underneath the floor, and that causes like the, the strong influence. Uh, yeah. yeah, but robots are one thing. Uh, we would like to do uh, localization. So say we have a somehow, say using that robot or, or using a phone or some way, uh, construct a map of the magnetic field. Uh, we can do then positioning in the field. But uh, I'm skipping this uh, localization example because we can go even further. We can do simultaneous localization and mapping, which means that we have, we have just start our phone and start moving in in the space we are interested in. And we want to create a map of the magnetic field in that space. Uh, and at the same time, use the map that we have obtained that far to improve our knowledge of where we are. So say you would like walk around your office and when you come back to this room, because you started here, you would then be able to use the, like pre-existing knowledge of the magnetic field here to correct for any drifts in your sort of like localization trajectory. And um, this is actually quite a challenging problem for uh, several reasons, but uh, one of the main, main reasons is that uh, you need to store a lot of information because the magnetic field is, is a dense thing, it's existing everywhere, and you need to do a lot of computation which sort of is demanding and certainly not typically done on, on smartphone. We have a very recent paper uh, published this summer in, in the Fusion Conference um, where we actually propose a way of, of actually being linear both in time complexity with respect to the measurement points and we have like linear memory scaling in, in map size. And uh, this is actually the final video of the presentation so enjoy now. The, the camera uh, the video here is only for, for reference, so you see that where we are going. The hexagons is part of how to represent the map of the magnetic field. And uh, you're going to see a magnetic field map being built and used at the same time. So like the trajectory is a bit boring. Uh, we are walking uh, in a rectangular shape just to show that there's no drift and actually the, the map helps a lot. Um, so we walk around. A lot of uncertainties, the, the particle cloud is certain, but then when we come back where we sort of started, we can actually use the information and then correct for any possible drifting we have. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be pretty boring now because I can sort of spoil it for you and tell it that it's actually gonna stay on, on track until the very end. Um, Great.
those are some poor, poor students doing some exercises there and we just disturbed them by walking around. I'm trying to reach the, the climax here, which is showing that actually we are not only doing this in 2D, but we actually have a 3D map with uncertainties related to the knowledge of the magnetic field. And uh, these are the components we inferred, this vector field, three components, and it actually works in 3D as well. So uh, this is one of the buildings in, uh, in the University of Cambridge, where we actually walked uh, through, through the floors and back, and we actually can correct for, for, for the drift even in 3D. And we even tried it in one of the nice colleges there. Uh, didn't work as well. Turns out that they didn't use metal that in those days when they built these <laughs> buildings. Um, good. Then uh, let's have a short recap. I went through uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, I hope you, you're convinced now that these are good models for many things. Um, I talked about the connection to stochastic differential equations. Um, this is sort of the key thing to actually make, it, make these models solvable in real time and online. Um, what I like here uh, is that these models are kind of like white box, or if not white, then at least gray. So uh, you actually encode prior knowledge that you sort of uh, know about, and uh, you, that's like sort of quite like uh, transparent in the model how you use it, sort of it would be like smoothness assumptions or periodicity. Uh, the prior knowledge might come from uh, some mechanistic um, models say you know that the car can only like move uh, forward and, and turn, not like move sideways. Um, or the prior knowledge might come from, from some like, like physical, like first principle models, uh, say like as in the magnetic field case where we assume it's generated by a scale of tension. I showed you some examples of, of using information from several sources, and these things are actually like runnable on, on your smartphone, your smartphone, and all your phones as well. Good. Um, I have some videos and stuff on my homepage related to these things, also links to the, the original publications and things that we found there. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you are into, into that kind of things. And uh, shameless self-promotion, uh, the book uh, explained many of these things. Uh, it's going to be out, out at the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arno. This was a really good presentation. And by the way, I'm going to buy your book. Don't worry. Uh, uh, but now it's time for questions. Please, uh, the audience, or, or also, uh, I don't know. Any questions? Get All right. OK, I have actually two. One is more general question, and one is just small detail. So the uh, more general uh, question is uh, also, Arno, could you comment on the relationships between the kind of more classical probabilistic models, like Gaussian processes, and others, and, like, and more modern uh, neural networks-based models also, maybe, which uh, takes into account well, the roles of probabilistic uh, neural networks. So I guess you also have uh, visited universities in Cambridge, as you told, and also some maybe startups. What is that? What's what's you, your view on this uh, relation? Okay. Yeah. Please repeat. The question. Yeah. Um, so I'm repeating the question. Um, so the question was, um, uh, what is the relation between uh, GPs and then uh, maybe in terms of, of use cases and. Uh, things and then neural networks based models and uh, how uncertainty quantified in, in different model families. So um, yeah, uh, I'm a pragmatic person. Uh, I like using models uh, which work in different like then, uh, applications. So uh, let's say uh, um, for time series models, uh, I'm usually definitely going with, with GPs. Uh, then say we have a machine vision problem, for example, then uh, GPs, is, they are probably not, not the best way to go. Then I would use like neural network based models. Uh, but it's like 
you shouldn't fix the model family. You should all, always like consider a problem and then start thinking of how to solve the problem. And because if you choose the model uh, before actually thinking of the, the problem at hand, that's always sort of a bad thing, I would say. I hope that's answered the, the question. Okay. Yeah, the small question about one of the applications. Uh, it is about the, um, uh, if you're experimenting in your bedroom with a smartphone. So when you uh, press the button at the wall, the, on the picture, the orientation of the wall was kind of already drawn, I guess, kind of correctly. So how the angle of the wall was determined? Yeah, um, so the question was uh, about the, the bedroom experiment, <laughs> um, meaning the, the inertial navigation where I touched the phone uh, against the wall, different cases. So um, uh, it's explained in more detail in the paper, but uh, in short, so when the phone touches the wall, it lies like along the wall. Oh. Um, so I just use the information that that what is the sort of orientation of the phone at that moment when I press the button. Oh, okay. And then, uh, as you notice, when I came back and pressed num number one again, then sort of I indicated that this is the same wall where I started from. Mm -hmm. So it, it then sort of injected some like knowledge that actually now we are back leaning against the same, uh, actually a plane uh, as we, we were in the, in the beginning. So that sort of also like constrains the model. Yeah. So if you, if you like go back to watching the video, um, then you see that it sort of locks to the wall. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I indicate like the wall number every time I touch wall. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, so in these examples, you were using time series models to in infer what was happening while you were doing the measurements. But the a more interesting application is then to use it for forecasting. And do you see that Gaussian processes can be used for that with as impressive results? So the, the question was that uh, that in, in the examples, uh, I used GPs mostly for for uh, for explaining exploratory analyses and then for, for modeling like the, the current state of the system. but could they be used for forecasting, which with, with as good results or as impressive results? Uh, the short answer is, is yes, definitely. Uh, the longer answer is, is a lot longer. So then again, uh, of course, uh, uh, how does it go? Uh, predicting is dif difficult, but predicting the future is even, even more difficult. Um, so of course, then your prior assumptions need to be pretty good, because then you sort of need to account for or sort of uh, also knowing things that might happen in the future. Um, so then if you have constrained your model that you have a stationary thing, and then at some point there's something sudden happening and uh, it you know, turns into a non-stationary thing, then sort of your model assumptions are wrong, and then, then you're on the rocks after that. But, uh, if you're like tune your model carefully uh, and your application is the right one, then yes. Okay. That was a bit fuzzy, but I admit. Yeah, there are, there are cases where, where they can be used for forecasting. To continue that question, uh, um, how would you teach your method to upcoming quant in, in uh, finance who want to manage portfolios? The question was, uh, how would I train the model uh, basically for financial applications, uh, in, in short? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm usually a bit cautious about doing financial applications because uh, you can probably only go wrong there. So <laughs> no, no one's going to blame me if I predict the, the, uh, uh, the bad forecasts for, uh, for the weather, but someone might get upset if I, I do a bad method for forecasting money flows. Um, well, uh, more seriously, uh, I think the, in finance the problem is usually that, that uh, the data that you train on is probably not the kind of data that you're going to see in the future, which is kind of tricky. So then you probably need to inject 
more expert knowledge in the model that, than you can do without being an expert. If that's the short answer, maybe. Yeah. That's a good one. More questions? If not, uh, thank you very much, Arno. Uh, this was a really interesting talk. Um, so this was the AI webinar series um, in Silo AI. My name is Kaimika Jörg. I'm working as the head of research here. And I'm very, very glad that we had Professor uh, Anna Salim here today. Uh, this was intriguing, and uh, you can view this also on uh, our web page. So, thank you, Arno, for coming here. Um, I wish you all the best. This was really interesting. And by the way, I'm going to buy a book, and I'm going to also uh, check your papers. This is really cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.